We're going to go ahead and start reading in verse 18, uh, down through verse 25, and then we will go back through these verses uh, together. But follow along with me, starting in verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Who is that verse talking about? Got an idea? Father of many nations? Abraham, yes. This is a continuation of the verses that were before this. The verse goes on to say in verse 18, According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. He was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness, that it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. In the last couple of lessons, uh, we have seen the Apostle Paul use Abraham as an example as a witness on the stand, if you will, of somebody who loved God and also someone who put his faith or placed his faith in God. Abraham is a great example, although he was being used at the time by uh, many of the Jews uh, in in a complete opposite way. Uh, Paul used him as a great example to prove that salvation comes by faith and by faith alone and nothing else. He's shown us over these last several verses, you cannot depend on keeping the law for salvation. You can't depend on good works to save us. We can't depend on anything external to save it. It Save us is only through a simple faith, and we're going to use that term again tonight. It is a simple faith in Christ. Not that it's, you know, it is, uh, what I mean by that, it's not complicated. All right, it's, it's, it, it's a simple way of coming to God. It's through one person. It's through Jesus Christ. Now, to show us how faith works, uh, Paul is going to use one of the greatest miracles that we have recorded for us in the Bible, and it is from the life of Abraham. And it's the miracle of Isaac being born. Isaac was the promised one, and um, we're going to talk about that promise in detail uh, tonight. Now, what, what makes his birth so special? Well, his daddy was 100 years old, and his mama was 90 years old when he was born. Uh, I would say that's pretty special. That's pretty unique. Uh, the Guinness World Book of Records records that the oldest mother on record is Ruth Alice Kissler. She gave birth to a baby girl at the age of 57. Um, that's getting up there. Um, uh, for having babies. Uh, this, uh, there was also a report, uh, although it can't be substantiated, of a woman named Ellen Ellis, who was said to be 72 in 1776 when she had a child, 72 years old. But you think about it, both of these women, whether 57 or 72, both of them uh, compared to Sarah are more like teenagers. <laughs> you know, so... I mean, this this is a big, big deal, and again, it it is nothing short of a miracle. Well, Paul tells us that Abraham's faith was in that promise, that promise of the birth of Isaac, and it was simply faith in what God said. God said it, Abraham believed it, he put his confidence in that, he, he trusted what God said, and because of that, it brought salvation to him. Notice Abraham did not have a weak faith. He did not have a hope so faith. Matter of fact, in verse 20, we are told he he was strong in the faith. He was strong in faith, and that's the title of the lesson tonight. We're going to look at that faith. Notice, first of all, where did Abraham place his faith? Where did Abraham place his faith? In what direction did Abraham direct his faith? Well, look at verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to who? To God. Verse 20 uh, tells us that his, his faith, he did not stagger in his faith. Have you ever seen two boxers going at it in the ring, and all of a sudden one of them nails the other one right on the button? I mean, he, he rings his bell, and, and all of a sudden he staggers. 
and he doesn't even know where he is at the moment, and the other boxer realizes, I can jump on him now. I, I really need to apply the pressure here because he is staggered. He was, he was solid before. He had his stance. He was in control of what he was doing, but all of a sudden he is staggering around the ring. Well, the same word can be applied here. Abraham uh, had a lot to be staggered by. These were impossible odds that were being thrown at him, but yet his faith never wavered. He believed in God without reservation, that God was going to keep his word. Now, God made this promise to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son, and it seemed like an incredible impossibility. But Abraham believed that God could do the impossible. Do you believe that tonight? Is that something that you could testify? I believe God can do anything that he wants us to do. And that's really what salvation and really any part of our life comes down to. Are we going to believe God or not? That's about as simple as you can get. I mean, do we believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved? Well, God said it was. Do we believe God or not? Do we believe that God can supply all of our needs? God said he would. Do we believe God or not? Do you believe that God is preparing an amazing place for you? Even right now, Jesus said that he was doing that. When this life is over, you'll see that. Do you believe that? All right. And then do you believe that you will see your saved loved ones again? Do we believe God or not? And these are all the promises from God that is given to us in his word to those who believe. And here's the truth. Faith that is placed in God is faith that will always be rewarded. You put your faith in God, you'll never be disappointed. There'll always be a reward on the other end. Notice the second thing here. How long did Abraham's faith last? In verse 18, who hoped against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. When God first gave Abraham this promise, he was 75 years old. Even then, it seemed impossible. But the last time that that promise was confirmed, he was 99 years old. It really must have seemed impossible at 99 years old. Yet, again, his faith never wavered. And the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God. That word, believe, the tense of that verb, means that he believed God when the promise was given, he continued to believe God over those years, and he believed God up to the moment that that promise was fulfilled. In other words, he never stopped believing. Let me encourage some of you tonight who's been praying, maybe, maybe for a need in your own life, maybe you've been praying for somebody else, maybe it's for their soul, maybe it's a need that they have, um, but, but you've been praying, and maybe you've been praying a long time, uh, for that. I want you to know something. God has not forgotten about your prayer. That prayer may not have been answered yet, but God has heard your prayer. If you're one of his, he listens to the prayers of his children. He's heard your prayer. He's not forgotten about you. So my encouragement to you tonight is don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Just keep doing those things, and God will, in his time, accomplish his will. He, he, he will do it because he's told us that he'll do it. Notice the third thing. How determined was Abraham's faith? Well, we know Abraham's faith was very determined because, first of all, he refused to listen to reason. He refused to listen to reason. Look at the words at the beginning of verse 18. It says, Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. Against hope, believed in hope. In order for Abraham to believe that this promise that he and Sarah was going to have a son, if it was going to be kept, then he had to keep his eyes on God and not on Abraham. He, he couldn't have done that. I mean, it had been very easy uh, for him to, I mean, can you imagine him going down to a stream or a river and looking at his reflection in the water and saying, how in the world is this possible? There's no way I'm going to have a son. It would have caused serious doubt to form in his mind, even maybe even given over, if it stayed there long enough, to give over to unbelief in his heart if he would have focused on himself. He could not focus on his circumstance. 
his situation. Uh, all of those things would, would have caused him to doubt the promise that God made to him. I mean, he could have said, I'm, and I'm sure he probably thought these things, I'm too old, Sarah's too old, nobody's had babies that are our age. We tried to have babies when we were young, but it didn't work, so why is it going to work now? You know, the neighbors, the doctors, uh, reason, common sense, all say it's impossible. But apparently, Abraham did not allow himself to give in to negative thoughts. He refused to do it. I'm not going down that road. And by the way, that's a choice that all of us have to make every day. It's easy to go down the road of negativity. I mean, I went, you could probably think of an example today, from today, that you heard something. And it might not even have been a, maybe a, a negative thing, but you heard it, and all of a sudden, your mind starts going there. We've got to throw the stop sign up. We've got to say, nope, not going there. I'm not going to believe that. I mean, if you watch the news or listen to the news, it's real easy to go there. I mean, the world's coming to an end tomorrow. I mean, you know, they're going to drop bombs on us tomorrow. The next new plague is on the horizon. The stock market's going to bottom out, you know, next week. I mean, all kinds of, it's easy to go down that road. Or, here's the alternative, we can focus on God. And that's where we ought to be. God, the stock market might crash. There might be a plague down the road. You know, all kinds of bad stuff may come, but I got you, and you're all I need. And I think that's where Abraham was. I think that's the place that he had gotten to in his life where he realized, keep my eyes on God, and all this other stuff is going to work out. God had given him his promise. That was enough for him. Notice the second thing. He refused to look at reality. In verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Dr. Ray Pritchard gives a possible timeline for the 25 years leading up to Isaac being born. I said it's possible. Uh, he kind of did it in a humorous way. But anyway, he used the years of Abraham to come up with this. Listen to what he wrote. At age 76, they buy a crib. At age 78, they make a list of possible boy names. At age 80, they order a supply of super absorbent diapers. At 85, Abraham goes hunting while Sarah's friends give her a baby shower. 86, puts up wallpaper in the baby's room. Age 90, subscribes to New Parent Magazine. Age 93, he and Sarah start Lama's classes. Age 96, goes through a practice run to the hospital. Age 98, packs a suitcase and sets it by the tent door. Age 99, Abraham scratches his head and says, I wonder if God was just kidding me. I love how you put all that together. Let, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Abraham ever doubted? Yeah, I guarantee you. You know how I know that? I know he did because he was human. He was human just like you and I. You know, we talk about Sarah laughing. You know, when she heard the news that a baby was born. But do you realize that in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, 17 and 18, it tells us that Abraham also laughed when he heard the news that they were going to have a, a, a child? Now, I'm sure there's times when he doubted, but here's the key. He acted on belief. He had doubts, but he acted on belief. And there is a big difference between the two. I'm sure that all of us have had times when our faith is mixed with unbelief. We have those thoughts. They're very natural for us to have those kinds of thoughts concerning things about God, concerning things about Jesus, concerning things about heaven, hell, things that we read about in the Bible, things in life. We have all kinds of different things that go through our mind. And we say that we have faith, but that does not mean because we say we have faith and we do have faith, it doesn't mean you're never going to have any doubts. It, it doesn't mean you're never going to have any questions about things. Faith is when we trust God's Word in spite of doubts, and we act on that. In other words, a lot. this, this is me. This, this may be you too. As I'm going through a day, man, I've got all kinds of things going through my mind, and I might have a lot of doubts that I'm trying to work through, doubts about how this is going to work out, and that's going to happen, and what's going to happen to this person, and, and, and all these different things. And I'm going through that, but then how do I let that affect me? 
Do I still keep praying? Do I still keep going? Do I still keep believing that God's going to intervene with this? My actions tell more about my faith than what goes through my head. I'm going to have doubts. I'm human. Just like Abraham had doubts, you're going to have doubts. But Abraham was a man who believed and doubted at the same time, but again, he acted in faith. Because faith can be a battle sometimes. It's almost like a, a, a wrestling match going on inside of us. Faith and unbelief, faith and unbelief. And it can be a struggle. And all through our life, there's going to be those times that doubts creep in. But when we're tempted to give in to those doubts, the temptation is strong sometimes. What we must do during those times is go back to this truth. God will always do exactly what he promises he will do. That's what keeps us grounded right there. God will always do. How? I, I don't see how this bill is going to get paid. I just, I, there's no way. We don't look at our bank account. We don't have the money to pay this bill. How can this is not possible? That's doubts, is it not? Has God always taken care of us? Did God promise to always take care of us? Yeah. Then that's what I go back to. God always keeps his promises. And I think that's what kept Abraham grounded through all of this. From the time he was given the promise to the time the baby um, was born. Verse 20 tells us as much. It says, he was strong in the faith because he gave glory to God. He gave glory to God. So the first question, where did Abraham place his faith? In God. Look at the second question. Why did Abraham's faith please God? We see that in verses 21 and 22. And being fully persuaded, that first phrase there, Abraham was fully persuaded. What I see in Abraham is a man who didn't look for reasons to doubt God. Some people go through their life that way. They're just looking for a reason to doubt. Abraham didn't do that. He didn't allow his mind to dwell on that. He just continued to believe what God said. He praised God for keeping his promises. I, and he praised God for keeping this promise before it was ever fulfilled. He gave God the glory for his son being born before his son was ever born. You know, something I found that, that is very helpful and very encouraging to me is to look back in my life and say, you know what, God was with me there. And back there, I, w I didn't see how it was going to work out. I had doubts, but God did it. And that helps me today to keep moving forward and to continue to trust him and believe in him. That's the kind of faith that pleases God. You don't know how it's going to turn out. But ahead of time, you give him glory because God is the one who made the promise. You know God's going to do it. I can't tell you how and I cannot tell you when that God is going to answer your prayer. You know that prayer I mentioned a little while ago, the thing that you've been praying about? I can't tell you why he ha hasn't answered that prayer so far. But I can tell you this and encourage you to do this. Keep trusting him anyway. Keep believe Why? Because God is always good. God is always right. God is always faithful. Those three things, God is always good. God is always right. God is always faithful. Believe that with all your heart and just keep doing what you're doing. Notice the second thing about Abraham's faith here. Abraham was fully persuaded that God was able, it says in verse 21. He was able also to perform. It didn't matter if the problem was a big problem or a little problem. Abraham believed God could handle it. And we see that demonstrated later on in his life. Um, in, I didn't put the scripture down, but it's in Genesis. You know the story. Um, God comes to Abraham one day. Isaac is a teenager by this time. He's been born all those years ago, and now he's a teenager. And God says to Abraham, this is mind-blowing to me, Abraham, I want you to go up to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice Isaac, your son, to me. Think Abraham wrestled with that one for a while? I do. I think in his mind, and in his, in his heart, there was a war going on. It would be in mine. I would first of all think I was going crazy. I would say, I don't, I'm not sure that was God that told me to do that. That doesn't sound like something that God would tell me to do. 
And then once you get beyond that and you realize this is God speaking to me, this is God's will. I mean, because I, I know this has probably never a- happened to you, but has God ever asked you to do something that maybe uh, you thought was kind of crazy? Yeah, I have. Pl- several times in my life that's happened. And so once you get beyond that, this is God's will, then, then why? Why, why, do, why, would, why would God give me a son that we prayed for all those years? And I promise you, that was a spoiled kid. He had to be. To wait that long and pray that long for a kid, I guarantee you, they spoiled Isaac. Why would God give them a son and allow them to watch him grow up to be a teenager and invest all that time and energy in him? And they were so proud of their boy. To now say to them, I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to kill him. Working through that, I promise you, there were doubts. There were doubts about his own faith. There were doubts about God. There were doubts about the calling or the the command there. All kinds of different things. He's working through that. But I love what Hebrews chapter 11 says about it. Listen to what it says. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he, so he obeyed, right? He did what God told him to do. He didn't understand it, but he did it. And he that did, or he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was, here's the word, able to raise him up even from the dead. Abraham had to get to that point And and all of us work through this. We work through our emotions. We work through our feelings, our rationale. We get to this point of saying, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't have an explanation for this. I don't know why you want me to do this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey. And God, I know know enough about you to know this. You're not going to ask me to do anything that is contrary to you, contrary to your will. I've known you too long. I know this about you. And God, if you think this is best, I'm going to do it. Now, keep in mind, the promise that God had given Abraham that through Isaac, he was going to have all these kids, all these descendants. What's going to happen if Isaac is dead? Abraham had never seen anybody resurrected from the dead. I mean, we we have the benefit of looking back in the Bible and we can see those in the Old Testament that were resurrected. We can see those in the New Testament that were resurrected. Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter, even Jesus himself. And we can say, yeah, it's possible. (laughs) It's possible. I've never seen it happen, but it's possible we've got God's Word to back it up. Abraham didn't have that. All he had ever seen, if you kill it, it stays dead. How is God going to do this? How am I going to have you? But that verse said that even, Abraham thought in his mind, even if I sacrifice him, even if I take his life, God is able to raise him up. God can bring him back to life if that's what God wants him to do. And that's, that's the point that all of us have to get to in doing, knowing and doing the will of God. God And most of the time, we don't have everything figured out when God's telling us or asking us to do something. God says, do this. We say, okay. But I don't have to figure out everything. Because God, this is your will. I'm just going to follow you. I'm going to do what you said to do. What does all that tell us? It tells us we can count on God. He's still the same all-powerful God today as he was in Abraham's day. And the question was asked in Abraham and Sarah's day, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And by the way, the answer to that question is still no. It's still no. It hasn't changed because God hasn't changed. And so Abraham's faith was the right kind of faith. It was a faith that pleased God, and it pleased God so much that in verse 22 it says, therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. God saved Abraham's soul because Abraham took God at his word. And that's what it comes down to with salvation, does it not? You're going to believe God or not. So the first question, where did God place his, or where did Abraham place his faith in God? Why did Abraham's faith please God? Because he believed God no matter what the situation was. Look at the third question. What makes Abraham's faith so powerful? What makes it so powerful? Well, 
It's the faith that can make anybody right with God. That is, that is powerful. Look at verses 23 and 24. Now, it was not written... Get my page turned here. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. This kind of faith not only had the power to impute righteousness to Abraham, but it also had the power to impute righteousness to you and me. Same kind of faith. Everybody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ has the power to save us, to save our soul. It's not enough to believe that there's a God. It's not enough to believe in the promises of God. It's not enough to have faith. You ever talk to anybody that said that to you? Oh, yeah, I have faith. Faith in what? You can have faith in that pew, and it's not going to get you into heaven. You know, it, you have faith that it'll hold you up, and that's good, I guess, but it's not going to get you to heaven. It must be faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.9 and 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The promise of salvation comes down to one person, Jesus. There is no salvation in any other. Jesus is the central focus of every promise in the Bible that's ever been given. He is the one whom all nations of the world will be blessed. He is the one who on the cross paid our sin debt, rose from the dead to be our Savior, he is the focus of our faith. And if he is not the focus of a person's faith, that faith is dead. And the Bible is very clear. That faith is no good. It does, doesn't do that person. They can be as sincere as they, they want to be, or they can be. It, it's not enough. So Paul's conclusion in this section as we close out this chapter makes it clear that nothing else but faith in Jesus will work to make us right with God. Now you have a question at the bottom of your paper. That's a personal, very personal question. I would encourage you to check one. The question is, can you say with all your heart that you are trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation? Oh, yeah. No, don't do that. Think about it. Is he the only thing that you're putting your faith and confidence in for your salvation? Check yes. Check no. If you check yes, I'd encourage you when we pray in just a few moments to take the time to thank Him for allowing you to know Him. Thank Him for what He did for you on the cross of Calvary. You know, so many times we, we, we pray. Most of us probably pray every day, numerous times of the day. But how many times a day do we say, Jesus, I want to just pause just for a few moments and I want to go back to Calvary with you and I want to thank you for what you did there for me. Thank you for laying your life down for me. I encourage you to do that. If you answered no to that question, then I would remind you of what Paul has used Abraham to say here. It's not about works. It's not about adding to Jesus plus something. It's not about keeping the law, being good enough. Again, the only thing that can save anybody today is faith in Him. Faith in Him and Him alone. So, Anyway, I would encourage you to give good thought to those. And then when, you, when you're talking to people, having conversations with people, take them to that question right there. That's the all-important question. And that is the question, which will mean heaven or hell, salvation or being lost for every single person. Any questions about the lesson tonight or the verses that we've covered?